crisis of the 80s or Asia in the crisis of the 90s, we were told by the IMF what we needed to do. And we did something very similar to what Europe is doing to Europe you know, at present. And the conclusion of all of us, and some African countries went through the same process, the conclusion of all of us was to say never again. Never again are we going to be subjected to these policies because we saw the social debt you know, that was, you know, we were told to do this and this and this to reduce the debt. And while reducing the debt, we were increasing and increasing the social debt. And we said, never again. What was the way of doing it? The way of doing it was, on the one hand, learning the lessons that you, know, you better keep your, keep your macroeconomic balances in place. That lesson was learned. Uh, but the second lesson was to say, as soon as we have the resources, Mr. IMF, thank you very much. Here is the money. Next time around, we want to have the freedom to apply the policies that we believe are the most appropriate for that crisis, which we don't know when it will come. We decided to do this not because we knew that there was going to be a crisis in 2008, 2009. We just didn't want, when it came, to be in the hands of the, of the, of the IMF. And that policy freedom, which we gave ourselves, permitted us then to think, to think differently. Uh, it also, it also, we also utilized it rather soon in terms of having a much better regulated financial systems. And the, the, the emerging developing world did not have a crisis of its banking system. We had the effect of the global economic crisis, and we had the effect of large banks from, from, from the developed country taking away resources that were in our countries. That, that, was, that explained some of the things that Dilmas was, was presenting. But our, 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 our financial system was better regulated, and most also had public banks that played a very important role in promoting the, the, the investment process that we, were, that we wanted to put in place. And of course, we had learned a good fiscal, fiscal management. Now, what am I saying all of this? Because the comment I want to make is, well, how do we apply this policy space, and I would say this, this certain self-assurance, which has certainly been reinforced by the fact that the crisis you know, began in the United States, that the crisis is very clearly still in Europe, that Japan has been in a situation of you know, instability, not, 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 not great social stability, but an economy that doesn't find the, what is the next stage in its development. So that the, the classical relationship, I'm still talking ideas and concepts, the classical relationship in which the north-south relation is to say, look, we develop first, we know how to do it. The development cooperation is about how can we help you in your countries do the sort of things that we did in our countries in order to develop, uh, that schema is broken. And that schema will never be reconstructed. For the very simple reason that there's no reason why we should today be saying, ah, you know, what a good example is this, 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 that. It's simply not possible. So what I would like to say is that we all have space of intellectual, analytical, and consequently, I think, political freedom that the South has never and that is probably, from a, from a process point of view, the most important thing that is happening today. And if that is so, then we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we use that space? Because I think that we have to use it not only in terms of defining our own policies, but in helping shape a world that is certainly requires a new way of looking at it, because there's no way we're going to get out of the crisis with the same policies that produce the crisis. And unfortunately, when you look at some of the things that are being done in the developed world, you have a feeling that, well, you know, this is more or less the same types of policies that you know, were, were there before. We did something different in many, in many countries. So I would like just to mention some, some of these uh, change, changes in the, and this is an answer to the develop, to, to the questions that you raise here, which is do we need a different growth path? Do we need a different development approach? And the answer is yes, I believe that it is that it is essential. So let me mention some of them. The, the first, I think the most important, is that we need you know, job-intensive growth. 
And, and if I had a comment, Gilmas, on your comment, is that I would have added all of the labor or, or, or employment implications of those figures. Because those figures in themselves, without the jobs figures, it, it, you know, you don't, you don't know how to relate. So, but it's very easy because you know, you know, you know better than I how to do that. <laughs> you just add the, add, add the jobs figures to it. But the, the point is uh, that uh, unless we put growth at the heart of development as the objective, uh, we're not going to make it. The, let, let me tell you what, what, the, what the figures are. We have uh, at the moment 200, 200 million. This, is, this comes from our latest uh, Global Employment Trends Report. 200 million are unemployed. Uh, 900 million, and this is an increase of about 50 million during the crisis. Uh, living, working families, working families which are working poor under two dollars a day. 80 million young people, either unemployed or stopped looking for work. You have 29 million fewer people in the global labor force in 2011 as a result of the crisis, which would bring it, you know, the total employment, unemployment, much much higher. Uh, I'm giving very general figures. All of this, of course, varies from region to region. But just to give you the, 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 the sort of the ballpark global nature of the problem. What is the problem with our present growth? Is that we we and, and, uh, is that we judge success by the rate of growth. What I'm suggesting is that we have to rate success by the rate of job creation. And that's a major analytical change, because every economist in the world today is still being taught that the manner you rate success is what is the growth rate. And what I think that we need to do is how do we judge the results of the growth rate in terms of jobs, in terms of social protection, in terms of income, in terms of other things, that, which are what people you know, does it mean that we don't need growth? On the contrary, we need as much growth as possible. But we need a growth that has a different objective. And, and, it, and implies a basic change in macroeconomic thinking in the following sense. That today, it's perfectly possible to say the following. Uh, we, we've, we have very low inflation. We have a balanced budget. Uh, you know, our, our, our savings rate has increased. Uh, our balance of payments is not bad. So we have, we have a fantastic, and our rate, our rate of growth, of course, is relatively high. Uh, so we have a very successful macroeconomic policy. Unfortunately, we have not created enough jobs. And this is, you know, you can take a look at the media for a long, long time, and you wind up with that. So why don't we change it around? Of course, low inflation, balanced budget, the whole thing is essential. But if it's just a big figure, and people are looking at it and say, hey, you know, the country seems to be doing all right, but you know, I'm still working in the informal economy, what does it mean? So we need a basic change of how do we judge success in our growth and development models. <clears throat> the second one, I would say, is that if we're going to go towards a job intensive growth and development pattern, then, then you need to have an income-led growth pattern. What we've had at, up to now is a debt-led growth. Uh, and let me begin with the, what I think is the most important one, which is the relationship within product, between productivity and salaries. We have made an enormous emphasis on the need to be competitive and productive. And in fact, most of our economies have become more competitive, more productive. So productivity has shot up. But the tendency of salaries to stay here while the productivity shoots up has meant that, again, I'm giving global figures, the global participation of wages in GDP has come down. Now, when you do that, in fact, what you have done is to contract demand. So this is not only just a social does it have social implications? It means that the part of salaries, which in general, most of it goes to consumption, you know, simply comes down. And that went over here to productivity that did not go to major investments in the real economy because investment rate globally 
stayed more or less the same, except for the, for the 2000 in which the emerging countries shot up and the developed came down. It went into the financial sector with all the consequences that, that we know. So I would say, second thing, we need an income-led growth at the individual level. And we know, for example, the big problem in the United States, certainly in Latin America, is that because this has been translated to wages, then the credit card begins to, you know, to function as a, as a supplementary wages, and this is happening in many places. Um, so, so you need the driver of growth, which is this. It is as much for governments as for many companies. Most of the takeovers of the last uh, 10 years, you know, I'm talking pre-crisis, we're done on the basis of debt. You know, you, can't, you, you, you bought a company and you bought it and you put a debt into it, etc. So this, the, the notion of the debt being a sort of a central element of the growth pattern has to be changed by income, income also for governments. And that implies, you know, a new look at what is your structure, your taxing structure in terms of ensuring the income. The third one, I think, is something that clearly has begun to happen, which is to put social protection floors you know, in, our, in, our, in our society. It's the notion that, uh, you know, that our citizens have a basic right to a certain access to social protection linked to education, to health, uh, to direct income transfers, etc. cetera. The, the, the fact is that we already have the examples in many countries, it's whether it's, it's Brazil or it's India with one job per, 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 per family in, in, in lower income Country, in lower income families or oportunidades in Mexico, Mexico Bolsa Familia, this has been done. And we, we, we've, done a, we've done a work in the ILO headed by former President Bachelet of Chile that is extremely interesting, uh, that shows that with a relatively small level of GDP, you can put in place you know, a basic social protection floor, adequate to each country. You know, it's going to be relative to the potential and the possibility of each country, but certainly we're talking about the least developed countries, some international support in the first stage will be necessary. Wh why am I mentioning this? Because our experience in the crisis is that we looked at two things, the expansion of social protection and the reduction in taxes as ways of stimulating. And what became clear is that all the resources that were put into social protection wound up you know, increasing demand in the economy. The reduction of taxes, which goes normally to middle classes and, and higher up, in conditions of crisis, were not invested, they were saved. So you didn't consume and you didn't invest, and you said, well, you know, situations are pretty bad, so I better, I better keep. Good, I received it, but I keep it. So I'm mentioning this because the social protection flow very clearly the crisis demonstrated, is a great, great, great element in sustaining demand. So if it's good in a crisis moment, why not put it into the whole macroeconomic scenario as one of the sources of demand that a society is going to be creating and at the same time, you know, producing the, the protection and the empowerment that a social protection floor uh, implies. The fourth element is the mismatch between our educational systems and our labor markets that won't develop too much that. It's something in which government, business, and the educational system has to develop a partnership in. And my fifth point is, what are going to be the drivers of, of globalization? We've had two great drivers up to the crisis. One was the deregulation of finance, and the other was the liberalization of trade. Those, 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 those were the ones that were pushing this, this model of globalization. Um, deregulation of finance you know, was an element of driving us to the crisis. How, what needs to be done? I think that the biggest problem today is that in the same manner as many of the very obscure, risky uh, financial products that led to the crisis were not understood by most people and among them the bankers, it's very difficult to understand what needs to be done with the, with the system, it's, it's, uh, yeah, 
you, you read the newspapers and for, uh, for I, I don't say for a layman, for expert, what is the Basel I and the Basel II and the Basel III and the deleveraging and this and this and that. It's a very complicated scenario. So in my mind, I asked myself once, well, you know, how do we simplify this thing? You know, and what came to my mind is the following. You know, the financial system is, is absolutely essential for, 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 for growth and for investment. So you, the financial flow is something that you have to keep you know, absolutely stable with as high saving rates as possible. But if you think as it has a flow, what comes to my mind in terms of the crisis is, is cholesterol. You know, we all know that there is good cholesterol, you know, and we know that there is bad cholesterol. Well, and the, the younger in the room don't worry too much about it. <laughs> Those of us of a certain age, you know, uh, have a more precise understanding of the issue. But this is my analysis of the financial system. You know, very clearly there is bad cholesterol financial instruments. And there are good cholesterol financial instruments. And what we have to do is to simply downsize the bad cholesterol financial. You know, and we know there's a lot of that. But it's up to the experts to tell us what are the bad cholesterol one. But, and re particularly reduce the profits coming from that. Because not only it's bad cholesterol, but you have high profits. So it's a double negative. And, and support the good cholesterol, which are the ones which is the flow of finance to innovation, creativity, investment, international trade, consumption, and a couple of other things that you know, are there. For that, the banking system historically has received public support, and they have a particular status. For the other one, there has never been a decision that the other one should have some sort of a banking status. It just got of sort of got into it without you know, anybody really noticing too much, except the ones that are creating the conditions for that to happen. So I think that that is where we have to go. You know, bad cholesterol, good cholesterol. From my point of view, it clarifies completely the picture. You know, I'm not going to have a technical opinion. I certainly have a political one. And that's the one. You know. The other thing is, what do we do with, with trade liberalization? You know, I was. Uh, because of the Global Jobs Pact and the reactions of the ILO to the crisis, we were invited to sit at the G20. I was there in the last meeting in Cannes, and the governments decided that the door round had come to a stop. And at the same time, decided to reinforce WTO, which I completely agreed. I think we, we, we need a strong WTO, not a weak one. But the fact is that for different reasons, elections, national elections, etc., you know, Global trade negotiations are no longer there. So this is a very major issue that we all have to think because the, the dangers of protectionism in a crisis situation are, tr are real. So this will probably mean that there's going to be more sub-regional agreements, uh, Mercosur in Latin America, more regional, wider agreements within a whole region. Inter-regional, now we're listening that Europe, some people in Europe are proposing the United States, why don't we have a bilateral trade agreement? Huh? Oh, you know, these things are going to begin emerging. So I think that we will have to have you know, a vision of what type of a trading system do we want if the global negotiations you know, are not going to be the instrument. You know, what will be, I think it's a fundamental uh, discussion uh, that, 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 that we should have. And I would say that I mentioned these as two drivers of globalization. I have President Nkapa here and Deepak Naya. I think that the way we have to take a look at it is also, you know, what is the social dimension of globalization? President Nkapa uh, was chair of the, the Commission on the Social Dimension of Globalization that we established at the ILO, and Deepak was also a member of it. The, 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 the social uh, uh, globalization that doesn't take into account the social dimension of it, and that's why I think that employment, social protection, as a global issue is so important, is again going to run counter because part of the reasons for which the, the political support for trade, for global trade negotiations came down, is something that is very understandable in politics. You know, the advantages of trade, which are diffused throughout, you know, throughout the system, are not seen physically. 
the downside of trade is seen, is seen physically. It's seen in communities, it's, you, know, you, 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 can, you can see it, you can touch it. So we need to have a concept in which the social dimension of globalization is a part. And let me finish with one thing which I believe in this, in the, in the contribution that we can make to shaping you know, what, a, what a future of growth pattern, development options, international agreements around what, like these sorts of issues that I'm mentioning. There is one thing that I think is essential, and which is the following. It's, it's how do we value work? How do we, how do we look at work? And unfortunately, part of this prevailing economic thinking has been uh, to look at work in terms of a cost of production, which it is, but then because of competitiveness, productivity, etc., as low as possible. Then to look at the worker as a consumer. Now there you want him to have as much as possible so that the worker consumes. So there's a conflict to begin with there. But work as a cost of production, worker as a consumer, and we stay there. And, and, I, and I think that we miss out totally on the social meaning of work. And we know that, that, that work is a source of personal dignity, of dignity of the individual. And we all, everyone in this room, proves itself you know, at work. And it's the way in which you have a satisfaction, but also you have a feeling of contribution. That you're doing something that is worthwhile. Uh, work, a decent work, because in the end what people are asking is, look, give me a chance at a decent job and I'll do the rest. But just give me the opportunity, give me the stepping stones so, so that I can really move. Uh, work is a source of, of family stability, uh, of a household stability, of the way people choose to live together. And a very unhappy family is, you know, is a family that probably doesn't have good work. And then people say, oh my God, what, are happening? what is happening to families? You know, this is terrible. Look at the young people, look at this, look at that. The connection with the fact that, you know, the quality of work is not there. Uh, the, we all know that, you know, work is a source of peace in the community, and a community at work is a community at peace. Uh, but you begin to see in the richer parts of the world, personal security, personal security, personal security, personal security. <laughs> All over, yeah, the rich. Because there is a social tension, and we, know the, we calculated at the ILO that you've had a thousand uh, protests in cities throughout the world in the last couple of years in 82 countries. So obviously, this, what is happening in the streets goes beyond a purely technical analysis of the things that we're doing. There is a social unrest, a social disquiet, a feeling that the, the systems, the authorities, those that have the power to make things better, are simply disconnected from what people are feeling today. And that is then reflected in the low valuation of political parties, definitely in the low valuation of finance, but that is happening, that is being also transmitted to business. Uh, so people are feeling very much alone. You know. This varies again from country to country. It's not exact in every place, but there is enough going on in the world to believe that you know this is a more a generalized problem. And I believe that part of it is not the only one, but part of it is due to the fact that we have not acknowledged that the quality of work, in so many ways, defines the quality of a society. It, it's as simple as that. The quality of a society depends on the quality of work that people have, because it's a you know, it's eight, nine, ten hours a day. And we, and we have then, in that sense, devalued work. You know, we have, we have not valued work, we are not valuing work the way it actually, the way it actually means in the, in the individual lives of ourselves, of our families, of the communities in which we live, the country, and the, and the political aspiration of people, and then the credibility of governments and others, I was saying, comes down. So I just wanted to say that I have a, an enormous belief that the space for us to think differently, to have the freedom to think differently, to be able to say, look, don't come and tell us what we have to do. We, have to, we are going to do what we believe is the most appropriate in our context. We have to address the type of economic issues that Yilmaz was telling us, which I think is a fantastic analysis that you've made of the different interactions between the global economy, our reality, the incredible role that China has been playing, is playing, and will play in the future. 
you know, it's a fantastic background for, for these types of decisions. My point is, in order to address them, we have to have the certainty and the assurance that we can think differently, not only that we can think differently, that that different thinking can influence the way you know, we organize the way international society is going to be shaped towards the future. So again, thank you so much for having this opportunity of coming and talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Maximo Moeka. <laughs> I now give the floor to uh, the Deputy Secretary General Vanta. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's no, Thinking about the current state of the global economy. Thank you. And the prospects and challenges that it raises for the South. Recent trends are indicating strongly that the world economy is extremely unstable and is teetering on the brink of another major downturn. Output growth has already showed considerably, slowed considerably during 2011, and anemic growth is expected during 2012 and 2013. The forecasts released recently in the 2012 United Nations World Economic Situation and Prospects make for some grim, grim reading. <clears throat> the West, for short, which includes research and analysis from MANCTAD, the United Nations Development of Economic and Social Affairs, and the UN Regional Commissions, describes a baseline scenario that sharply downgrades growth expectations compared to one year ago. This baseline scenario assumes that the key factors leading to economic fragility in the advanced countries today the worries about government debts in several Eurozone countries as well as the United States, the impact of fiscal austerity measures, and the high level of unemployment will continue to haunt the economy without getting significant wor significantly worse, but with no comprehensive solutions found either. And this baseline scenario is therefore appropriately called the muddling through. Um, with these assumptions, growth of world gross product is forecast at 2.6% for 2012 and 3.2% in 2013, a sharp downgrading from the 3.6% projected in the WESP update of mid-2011. Global output already slowed to 2.8% in 2011 down from the rebound of 4% we had seen in 2010. In this context, let us recall that in the past, the IMF used to regard global GDP growth of below 3% as a world recession. Most worryingly, the muddling through scenario forecasts very little improvement in the 64 million jobs deficit that has been left by the crisis. The continued jobs crisis will hold back the recovery as it dampens consumer demand, which in turn reinforces the downturn in trade and investment. These effects will further complicate fiscal problems, as governments' efforts to reduce their public sector deficits and debt would rather fail in such an environment. This model through scenario may even already seem too optimistic, and the WESP's more pessimistic downside scenario which forecasts a sharper fall in growth, may be the more likely outcome if the contractionary policies that are currently in place or on the horizon in many advanced countries do not change significantly. Such a negative view has been echoed in a slew of recent forecasts from international agencies and national statistical offices. The immediate prospect for developing countries and economies in transition envisaged in the West and in other UNCTAD publications is less threatening. Indeed, many have so far recovered faster and even benefited from greater inflows of capital. However, ultimately they cannot remain immune to the ripple effects from weaker growth and downturn in demand in the advanced economies, 
as much of their trade and production is linked to global supply chains producing for markets in the advanced economies. The increased ties among developing countries are helping to promote a degree of resilience. But in a highly integrated global economy, contradictionary, contractionary contagion in the advanced economies will affect all countries. And if the major developed economies enter the period of stagnation or mild recession projected in the baseline scenario, GDP growth in developing countries is expected to slide to an average of 5.6% for 2012, down from 7.5% in 2010. But if the more pessimistic downside scenario materializes, developing economies are expected to achieve only around 3.8% growth and the economies in transition may be even more strongly affected by international turmoil, with a projected growth of minus 2%. UNCTAD is concerned that such a significant downturn could provoke a lost decade for the global economy, risking the reversal of the development gains that have been achieved in recent years, and potentially even throwing into question the ability of democratic governments to tackle the most urgent concerns. This worrying prospect highlights the urgent need for action to restore global growth. Following the initial G20 efforts to coordinate global stimulus packages, attention in the advanced economies soon turned to debt consolidation and fiscal austerity. However, the idea of an expansionary fiscal contraction may be wishful thinking. Instead, what is needed to revive growth is an increase in demand. And while policy measures to support this may lead to additional fiscal burdens in the short run, there is little reason to doubt that many advanced countries have the fiscal space to achieve this. In the medium run, renewed growth will support a return to balanced budgets and fiscal consolidation. Yet, pursuing fiscal consolidation at a time when the private sector is also deleveraging can only create recessionary pressures. Secondly, if we are to prevent the risks of a recurrence of the financial crisis, greater efforts need to be made to strengthen the regulation of the financial sector. So far, the efforts made at the global level, which are largely limited to the reform of the Basel Capital Adequacy Accord, have only scratched the surface of the challenge. Indeed, at a time when the financial sector has been shown once again to be prone to costly bubbles and crises, I think ideas like the Tobin tax have to be seriously considered. At Davos last week, reportedly, a major part of the corridor talk was the financial sector complaining of overregulation. Thus, there is a risk of returning to business as usual, and it does not occur well for the world's poor. In such an unfavorable environment, what can the developing countries do to limit the impact of the global slowdown and support continued growth and progress in poverty reduction. It is clear that they will need to step up investment to sustain higher growth and to reorient their economies towards domestic demand. This will be all the more difficult for countries whose trade patterns remain heavily oriented towards traditional markets in the north, where the demand for imports is likely to remain low. Developing countries need also to protect themselves against volatile exchange rates and commodity prices, whether they are net commodity exporters or importers, which will be more than usually challenging given the highly uncertain external financing conditions. Damaging international spillover effects in the form of volatile short-term capital flows may be creating further problems in an already difficult environment. On a more positive note, many of the developing countries are finding national or regional solutions to help address these problems. Regional financing arrangements, such as the Chiang Mai Initiative, can help in some cases to minimize the effects of volatile global capital markets. South-South investment in trade is continuing to grow, accommodating to some extent the downturn in demand from the North and helping to promote economic stability and resilience. Indeed. South-South exports now represent 53% of developing countries' exports, up from 43% in the year 2000. Importantly, most of the developing economies, especially the larger emerging economies, 
can use their fiscal policy space to offset, some, to some extent, the effects of, cont of contraction by adopting more expansionary fiscal and monetary measures, including by using some of their large foreign exchange reserves. The fiscal balance of many developing countries had been steadily improving in the years leading up to the crisis, and many found themselves able to finance important stimulus and demand-maintaining packages. Expansionary fiscal policy can boost consumer demand and employment. It can also increase public investment directly and can indirectly stimulate private sector investment in incomes. These can lead to higher tax revenues and lower fiscal deficits, even if tax rates remain unchanged. In some developing countries, fiscal policies have been used alongside economic policies more broadly to strengthen the impact on employment and promote public investment in ways that can encourage structural change, leading to a more equitable and sustainable long-term development path. This should certainly include investments in new and emerging technologies, for example, renew renewable energy investments or public infrastructure investments that will not only help generate jobs, including in value-added activities, but which should also be part of a wider long-term development strategy. Not all countries are in such a position, however, and the final challenge I wish to emphasize is the need to ensure that sufficient resources are made available to the developing countries that possess limited fiscal space and which face large development needs. The situation for the least developed countries is a particular concern, especially for those that are heavily dependent upon remittances sent from the advanced economies or on official development assistance. Remittance flows have been affected sharply by the economic downturn, and some donor countries are already experiencing significant strains in the public balance. It is essential that sufficient resources are made available to help accelerate progress towards the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals and for investments in sustainable and resilient growth. In a nutshell, the current prospects of the world economy are probably captured well in the muddling through scenario. Though the risk of a second all-out recession remains present. It is therefore to be hoped that developed countries will move from a singular focus on debt consolidation and fiscal austerity to one of stimulating demand and employment, so as to restart growth in the North, on which many developing countries still depend. At the same time, developing countries should take measures to refocus their own economies on domestic demand, including through strategic use of fiscal space when available, and make full use of regional cooperation to ease the impact of the crisis. Easier said than done, you betcha. But the options available are not that many. And any positive scenario will have to include devising ways of reducing the growing in inequalities that have been accumulated, both within and between countries. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. I hope that our discussion will give us a strategy that will not involve much in our way through. Now let's hear the professorial analysis from Professor Nair. Thank you, Chair. It is always difficult to be the fifth speaker on a panel uh, that has spanned close to two hours because both time and patience are exhaustible resources. Um, even so, I'm going to attempt to, 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 to engage your attention uh, in a way that complements what my predecessor speakers have said and said with such elegance. It is more than three years since the global economic crisis surfaced in the United States. Its aftermath remains the path to recovery has turned out to be slippery and elusive. The crisis in Euroland runs deep. The recovery in the United States is weak and fragile. The resilience of the emerging economies is beginning to wane. And it is important to recognize 
that the Great Recession persists. Indeed, another possible crisis may loom on the horizon. Uh, this assessment is somewhat different from what most people had come to believe even six months ago. In retrospect, it seemed uh, that the developing world, some countries more than others, had on the whole fared much better than the industrialized economies and the transition economies. Uh, for one, the impact was less adverse. For another, the recovery was somewhat faster. And this worldview led to two conclusions. A, that the developing world or the South could continue to grow on its own steam, uh, a sort of decoupling view, uh, and B, uh, that this new South